Hello everyone, my name is Amal Nirgodkar. I'm here uh, today at uh, Patient Prism Live Studios at the Dykema's Conference 2022. 1,700 people are in the audience and I'm here with my good friend and somebody I've looked up to all my life, Dr. Scott Luna. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, Scott, um, I've always uh, loved hearing you speak on everything that has to do with making dentists better, making doctors hygienists better and making the whole experience better for, for doctors and your courses are sold out, they've been sold out for as long as you've been doing them. Um, but here at Dicoma we're looking at the DSO industry mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the industry is now composed of emerging groups that are growing very fast, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. And as they keep growing that, they're realizing some significant roadblocks that they're facing is like, oh my God, how do we set up an infrastructure? Now we got to set up call centers. We have to set up um, procurement processes. We got to figure out how to scale marketing. All these things are not easy to set up and they are a direct hit, obviously. I mean, you got to invest, you got to train, you got to do all that stuff. What solutions do you think are out there? I know you guys have done a lot of stuff with formerly Breakaway now at Dental Whale. On, on solving some of these problems that dental practices have, but how can you how can you address them on a DSO setting? Yeah, you know, I mean, as you look at the DSO industry, we've seen the billion dollar DSOs form, the jumbo DSOs, but maybe silently or quietly, what's also been forming are these service companies that build and provide DSO infrastructure they've been building to huge sizes as well. Right. If I am a DSO, an emerging DSO today, I do not want to spend a lot of my capital and my risk on building a call center and billing insurance on marketing, IT, um, things like that are very costly, very risky, risky and they, they really kind of um, blind us sometimes to what we need to focus on. Because they're very loud. If things, something goes wrong on phones or billing and insurance, that becomes very loud. It sucks us in. Today, we could do it a smarter way. We can rent the call center we wish to build. We can rent the revenue cycle management, the marketing, the IT support. All of those things, when I say rent, it's renting it from a company that has built those things to the size of a jumbo DSO. Right. For example, so... I, I wouldn't want to build my own call center today as an emerging DSO. I would want to have the high quality and low cost of a large call center that's already built to support DSOs. And sense. as you look at the progression of the growth of a DSO, every time we have to invest into that infrastructure, that infrastructure typically does not bring revenue. It does not bring Correct. EBITDA. It is a stepwise immediate increase in cost. Absolutely. But when you rent it, you just pay a little bit more for it as you grow. You don't get that stepwise increase in cost. It's not like you're suddenly paying for an entire call center. Sure. No, you just slowly grow over time as you have more locations, more patient volume, and you slowly pay for it. And you're paying for top level quality, Absolutely. which you can only get at a huge scale, huge size 100%. that we could never afford as an emerging DSO. So this is almost like the the virtual DSO infrastructure right. model right. that we're starting to see. And, and in that model too, if we use call centers as an example, not only are we renting a piece of a high quality call center, but that call center has technology that a lot of times we don't have or we haven't afforded. They can scale and use technology in ways that provide a lot of data. Right. And of course, patient prism is part of that whole, right. that whole experience and data. Absolutely, I mean, I think I've talked about this a lot, is that dental practices should spend most of their time with their patients and not a lot of time with insurance companies or, or, or doing things that take away from the patient experience. Well, let's add to that. It's not hard, excuse me, it's not easy to find staff today. Absolutely It's not. getting harder, it's getting more costly. If we have a DSO model that says every one of our locations will be fully staffed on site doing things the way they do it, right. that's hard to scale today. That Yet if sense. we outsource to DSO infrastructure, we, we, they don't quit, they don't get COVID, they, that's right. you know, we don't have to overpay them. That is a very solid, smart, predictable way of having a staffed model with a DSO. And how is, um, um, you guys at Dental Whale have built uh, many of these support services that almost you can have support services as a service, right? <laughs> like software as a service, yeah. right? And, and, and it's almost that model now, right? Dental Whale is now able to take 
all the world-class infrastructure, whether it's answering phones, whether it's marketing, whether it's um, other support services, you're able to rent them, lease them, and, 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 and get those economies of scale where it's still potentially, and, and pay as you grow, basically, then your cost will grow as you rise. Even if you decide to do anything on your own one day, it's okay, you can take that part out and still keep going. Yeah, you know, we're, we're one of several companies that are addressing this need. Um, if, for example, an emerging DSO with 30 or 40 locations could join our buying group and have supply prices as though they have 2,000 locations, right? Right. They could have call center support as though they had 2,000 locations. And at some point, if they feel they need or want their own call center, what a smart way to do it to rent a high quality call center and learn, learn. from it That's and right. grow to the point where you're finally large enough to actually justify the cost instead of getting hit with the cost up front. Instead of making your own mistakes, learn from somebody else's mistakes, right? And that happens. And, we and see that. Absolutely. Um, I have an interesting question for you. Uh, one of the things I'm seeing at Patient Prism offices struggle with is days booked out. Right? Yep. There's not enough capacity to serve the patients. New patients are calling, existing patients are calling. 60 days out, 90 days out appointments. That's unacceptable. Right? And, and how, do, how, do you, but how do you solve that provided, let's say there's, there's not an abundant supply of dentists and hygienists out there. So yeah. how are you, is there a way in operations to solve this? Yes, but it's not simple. Okay. But yeah, so there's actually, when you look at being booked out too far, yeah. I'll make it the first simple choice. You either expand your capacity to see those patients sooner, or you cut the patient demand down by like dropping insurance plans. Okay. Right? One of those two things gets you to become more profitable today. Okay. Now most of us do not want to cut our patient base. We That's want right. to expand, right? That's so right. we're looking at expanding capacity. Well, how do you expand capacity? Especially in an area, in a time where it's hard to find staff. Right. Okay, well, first of all, you go to things like assisted hygiene and expanded hours. And now you're not having to find as many hygienists. You have to have them assisted. But in order to have them assisted, you have to pay differently. Right. And in this area where, you know, you used to pay hygienists 35 or $40 an hour, and now you're paying $50, $55 an hour. Wow. We focus heavily on innovating how they're trained. Everyone else seems to me to be trying to figure out how to not pay so much. Right. We actually pay more than market, but because they're producing 2,500 in a day, wow. we're happy to pay them what equates to maybe 55 or $60 an hour based on our compensation structure. Then it's easy to retain and find new hygienists. And so therefore it's easier to expand capacity because we're paying more than most people. And we make, it makes sense for us because they're producing more than most hygienists. So that's one solution, you pay more. But how about in a situation where we have an office where they are in their, they, they, they have decided that a hygiene exam should be one hour or one hour, 15 minutes. Yeah, we, we schedule 90 minutes. 90 minutes. Yeah, right? yeah. But, but how do you then, there's no way you can put more patients in if it's 90 minutes. Oh, if, if, yes you can, because it doesn't take the hygienist 90 minutes, it takes the hygienist 50 minutes. The system oh, does all the other work. Interesting. You got multiple operatories. Also, imagine a situation where certain patients, if you don't book them soon, you lose them. And other patients, they'll stay for a little while. They'll wait a little while. Yeah. You can pre-block those new patients to be in sooner, whereas the existing patients may not pre be pre-blocked. That, that's that's uh, something you could do. You could also try to cut your time down. Right. If you could utilize technology and better processes, which we're talking about getting way deep into the trench of operations. Right. If you could change the way the appointment actually happens to be shorter, obviously you could fit more patients in. And there are ways to do that. For sure. But also don't forget you can open another practice. That's we have practices that are too booked out and that to us is an insurance policy on the next startup we, we build not too far away. There's just a lot of different knobs to turn. And unfortunately, a lot of us are so trapped in our own way of doing that's something, right. and that's all we see, that we forget there's some other things out, outside the box that right. could work. Especially in a, in a DSO, a lot of times our operational decisions are being influenced by a regional manager. Right. And we're listening to them, and we're almost putting a lot of trust in them to figure something out that's complicated. And it might not be. I mean, they might be good at what they do, but sometimes, you know, you kind of, all right, well, this is a different problem, and you mm -hmm. may not be suited to solve that problem. A question about hygiene, I'm really passionate about it, and I asked mm -hmm. this again this morning, is how do you get, number one, hygienists to produce not just more, 
you know, uh, but how do you get the hygienist to get treatment over into the doctor's chair? Oh, that's their primary responsibility in our practices. So I, I, I do talk a lot about, hey, our hygienists can produce 2,500 a day, but that's their secondary responsibility. That's a responsibility that pays today's bills. Correct. The primary responsibility is supporting the doctor in case acceptance. And there's a, there's a choreographed play that happens on every new patient, and the hygienist has certain lines, certain roles. Some of that has to do with what they say, we have them do what we, we've termed a pre-diagnosis to introduce certain problems to a patient using images. We use artificial intelligence software in front of a patient as a case acceptance tool. We have very specific uh, intro cameras that help us find decay as a case acceptance tool. Scripting, there's a place for that in certain situations. All of that turns a hygienist into one of the primary educators. And the result of that is that it takes the doctor way less time. Right. Which means we they, can cover more hygiene ops per day, which means we can expand hygiene without feeling the need to add more dentists, right. which helps if the doctor has openings in their schedule. You see, that's the other problem. You have some doctors that say, I can't cover more hygiene ops. But it, that's in part because their exams have too many steps in them. If we can mm -hmm. give some of those steps to the hygienist, the doctor can cover more columns and then their schedule is full. And if the hygienist can give some of their steps to the assisted hygienist, exactly, then there you have basically now able to see more patients. Um, and, and, and it's interesting what you said is that you, it almost makes me think that, that what Pat said this morning was, we treat our hygienists as providers. They're not just technicians cleaning teeth or doing SRPs, but we treat them as providers and, and we allow them to co-diagnose with the doctor. Yes. Is that important? incredibly important. In an ideal world, the doctor is the last one to tell a patient what the patient needs. They're the final one. If they're the first one, the patient hasn't built other trust ahead of that. Okay. And our job is to do things in a way where the patient will get the work done that they actually need. And we don't want to accidentally screw up the trust right. because we've done things in the wrong order. Correct. Um, here's the other thing. You know, most dentists are trying to look for another hygienist. I'm trying to look for a very inexperienced, low-level assistant that's going to be my hygiene assistant to add another column of hygiene. And that's so much easier to find. And now what does my hygienist do? What that person is built to do, co-diagnose, educate, and scale. Everything else can be done by another job title that's much easier to fill at a lower cost base. And the hygienist is okay with that if I've aligned their pay properly with the extra patients they're going to see. And all those pieces fall into place. And now, how do we deal with capacity? We add more operators. It's, it's not we're trapped and stuck because we can't find another hygienist. This is unbelievable. So where do, you, where do people get this knowledge from? I mean, this is crazy. I mean, I could talk to you all day long about this stuff. And, and you seem to have these answers. Uh, but so how do, you, how do people get this, this? Where do you get this wisdom? Uh, where do they sign up? How do people get access oh, to this stuff? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. If, if I, I train, I train about a thousand dentists and CEOs a year through BreakawaySeminar.com. We have very sp four specific events. They're two days long each, 400 pages of content. It's like drinking from a fire hose of this times 16 hours, and that's what oh we goodness. do. Wow. Um, but you know that is my passion. I if you can't tell I enjoy talking about this stuff and teaching what we know, and we know a lot because we also have our own DSO and because we have 20,000 dental practices connected to our services. Um, and because we've chosen to measure things other people haven't measured yet. And we've asked questions people haven't asked yet. And we've messed up a whole lot. <laughs> so, so we know things that we find very valuable and it's my passion to teach it. And I do that through one of our companies, Breakaway Seminar. It is such a pleasure and an honor to talk to you. I, I, I literally can't stop thinking about all the questions I want to ask you, but we're running out of time. Uh, uh, thank you, Scott Luna. I'm excited uh, to uh, be part of the Business Immersion Summit that's coming up in, in September. Um, if you need information uh, on that, I guess you go to dentalwhale.com. Uh, it's summit.dentalwhale.com, and you'll, it, that's our Business Immersion Summit, the ARIA this September. Really big, cool summit on the business of dentistry or breakawayseminar.com is how you get a hold of me and my team. Wonderful. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Okay, thanks a lot. Nice.